Welcome to Color Theory, the science behind the rainbow. I'm Christy Marcuselli, Marketing Manager for FISCOM. To prevent background noise, attendees will be in listen-only mode. You can type your questions in the question section of the control panel on your screen. If you can't see the control panel, you should be able to see an arrow with a red background. It's probably off to the side. Um, if you still cannot see the question section, even after clicking that, click on your uh, toolbar and click View, and make sure that the question area is checked off. The session is being recorded. The recording and the presentation will be shared with you via email tomorrow morning. Thank you very much for registering, and we appreciate this opportunity to talk to you about color. We're our speaker is Rebecca Daly of Ferro Nubiola. She is the Application Laboratory Supervisor and Technical Service Chemist for the Norcross, Norcross site of Ferro Pigments, Powders, and Oxide Division. She has eight years of industry experience in protective coatings and color solutions for coatings, plastics, and construction markets. She comes to our industry from the University of Southern Mississippi, where she obtained a degree in high in polymer and high performance material. During the registration process, you have the opportunity to ask questions. Rebecca will address your questions either in the presentation or shortly after. Same holds true for the questions that are being submitted during the presentation. In the documentation section of your uh, GoTo webinar screen, you'll see uh, a section that says handouts you will see that there's five handouts attached. Uh, one of them is the actual presentation. Uh, the other four are product literature brochures from Ferro Nubiola. Feel free to go ahead and download those at your leisure. I now turn the presentation over to Rebecca. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, as Christy said, today we're going to speak about color and some of the science behind the color. If I can get my screen to work. Okay, here we go. So today we're going to discuss a little bit about what color is and how we describe it. And then we'll go into some color and color difference measurements and then some of the colorants that we use in the industry. So what is this thing we call color? The production of color requires three things. A source of light, an object that the light illuminates, and then the eye and the brain to perceive that color or a computer to interpret the light waves, but more on that later. It all begins with light. Modern understanding of light and color began with Sir Isaac Newton in the mid to late 1600s. The common theory at the time was that prisms colored light and that light itself was just a combination of darkness and lightness. Well, through a series of experiments, Newton reflected the, the, the reflections from the prism off of a mirror back into a prism and white light was once again restored. From, from this experiment, he determined that white light was actually a combination of all the color wavelengths. He created a conceptual arrangement of color around a circumference of a circle and this is the same basis that we use today. He arranged the primary colors opposite of their complementary colors. So since light is a form of energy, it can be described by its wavelengths. The human eye is, is very insensitive. So the visible part of the spectrum is a very narrow band between 400 and 700 nanometers. Some of the sources that we think of as as light really emit white or nearly white light. That's the sun, filament light bulbs, fluorescent lamps, or any of the other various light sources that we use today. This light, as Newton discovered, is normally made up of all the visible wavelengths. When light strikes an object, one or more things can happen that affect what we see. The first is transmission. This is when the light goes through an object essentially unchanged. We see these objects as transparent or translucent. Absorption is when the light is absorbed by the object. And reflection is when the light is reflected or scattered by the object. 
if all the light is absorbed, the, the object appears black. If all is reflected, then the object appears white. It's the combination of absorption and reflection that gives us the world of color. Our eyes see the energy or the wavelengths that an object does not absorb. Therefore, we see what it reflects. So how do we describe what we see? This is not always a simple task. The human eye can detect nearly 10 million shades of color. The most common shades that we can distinguish between is the color green. And that's primarily because of evolution. Uh, throughout history, our eyes are, are more adapt to seeing green because it's so common in the world around us that we can distinguish the shades of green more easily than any other color. Also, women typically can see more color than men. This is a, an interesting but true statistic. And this has to do, once again, with our ancestors. When we were hunter-gatherers, women, of course, were the gatherers, so they had to be able to see color uh, to distinguish between the, the different flora and fauna. Men were the hunters. So they, could have, they had to see light better. So in the dawn or the dusk hours, they can more easily see their prey. And um, because of that, women have more uh, cones in their eyes, which is the color receptors. And men have more rods, which are the light receptors. And that has held true today. So genetically, women see better color. Men see better in lower light. There are various models on how to describe color, but all of them have three dimensions or parameters, hue, value, and chroma. Hue is the common color distinction, sometimes referred to as the shade. It's the dominant wavelength range that's reflected off an object. Value is the lightness or darkness of the color. This is sometimes referred to as the grayscale value. And then you have chroma. That's your intensity or saturation of the color. One of the most influential color modeling systems was devised by Albert, Albert Henry Munsell, who was an American artist. Munsell desired to create a rational way to describe color that would use clear decimal notation instead of a lot of color names that he considered misleading. He modeled his system as an orb around whose circumference ran the band of colors, arranged similar to Sir Isaac Newton's color wheel. Um, then extending from the top to the bottom were values from white to dark. And then from the axis to the center was a grayscale value as a gradient of color progressing from a neutral gray to the full saturation of the color. So with these three defining aspects, any of thousands of colors could be fully described numerically. Monzel named these aspects, or qualities, hue, value, and chroma. That's where our tri-stimulus nomenclature originated. So what color is it? Of course, this is red. So what, what's the shade or the hue? For primary colors, the hue or shade is typically described by using the adjacent colors on the color sphere. In the case of red, that would be yellow and blue. So for this particular example, it's a more yellow shade red. So what if it isn't a primary color? For secondary and tertiary colors, the hue or shade is typically described by using the dominant colors used in that color. For purple, this would be red and blue. How dark or light is it? The darkness or lightness or value can be visually described as how close in scale the color is relative to either black or white. For this particular example, this is a light red. How chromatic is it? The chroma describes the saturation or the intensity of the color. This is a very saturated red. In most presentations, I would actually have the audience respond um, 
to, to this particular slide. But as we see this blue as standard, I will describe the rest of the blues in comparison to this particular color. This blue is darker and more red shade than the original. This one is less saturated and more green shade. This is even less saturated but darker and more green shade. This is the least saturated thus far. And this is light, lighter but greener than the other. So which purple square is darker? Which has a more blue shade? They are actually the exact same color. Perspective can alter the way we perceive color. This can include background, light source, and even our mood at the time. Not all light is the same. Even though typically we see the light emitted as white light, different sources of white light contain different ratios of all the visible spectrum. So for halogen light, you typically see a more yellow undertone. For daylight, it's more balanced. And then when you have your cool white fluorescence, a lot of times you see a more blue undertone. This is where the infamous dress comes into play. This picture was circulated around the internet about a year or so ago, and people were debating whether it was a white and gold dress versus a blue or black dress. And the real um, difference is what we, what we saw as individuals depended upon the light we viewed the picture in, as well as the light that we are most accustomed to being in. So the way we perceived the color was based on the light sources that are most common in our own personal lives. Sometimes two objects will look identical under one light source, yet totally different under other lighting conditions. This phenomena is called metamerism, and it's a fundamental concept to remember when matching color. It happens when two objects or samples have different spectral reflectance curves. As an example, these two greens match under daylight. However, under cool white fluorescence, you can see that one is more yellow shade than the other. As I mentioned, this is because the spectral curves are different. Because different light sources have different ratios of the wavelengths present, they reflect those wavelengths differently based on that light source. So how do we really quantify if and when colors truly match? The first is to evaluate your sample using every light source under which the final product will be seen. And then we have color metric instruments. Since human color perception varies widely and is affected by light, sample size, surrounding colors, and the observer, color metric instruments provide a set of standardized conditions that help with consistency and repeatability. First are your colorimeters. These uh, quantify colors based on the three component theory of color vision. The eye possesses, possesses receptors for three primary colors, red, green, blue. This is common in a lot of paint manufacturers. You hear the RGB scale. This is where it comes in at. Therefore, colorimeters measure these three via three photo cells, which determine the red, green, and blue components and transmit the data to a microcomputer. The microcomputer then calculates the XYZ tri-stimulus values and captures the data. Then you have spectrophotometers. These are a little bit more in-depth. They quantify color by using many more sensors to separate the amount of light into its component wavelengths. The reflectance is measured at each individual wavelength of the visual spectrum. These can provide much more in-depth and complicated data. The tri-stimulus values are obtained by multiplying together wavelength by wavelength the spectral reflectance of the sample, the relative spectral power of the illuminant, 
and the tri-stimulus values of the spectrum colors defining the CIE standard observer. These are called weighing factors and are already programmed into modern spectral photometers. So how do they work? You have your light source. You get to choose your light source. And then the light is flashed, is concentrated on your sub subject, and is reflected back through a mirror into a sensor. And this sensor is what individually separates these wavelengths, multiplies them together, and then produces your CIE LAB color values. So how do we interpret this data? Tristimulus values are useful for defining colors, but they do not allow easy visualization of color. Mathematical models and graphing methods have been developed under the CIE, which is the International Commission on Illumination. These models are referred to as color spaces. Color spaces more closely express the relative attributes of color, such as lightness, darkness, saturation, and hue. They are particularly useful in measuring and comparing color differences between two samples. The CIE LAB color system is based on the opponent color theory of vision. This says that a color cannot be both green and red at the same time, nor blue and yellow. It was influenced heavily by the Munzel color system, where the true intention was to create a spatial representation of color that could be computed. In this system, L defines the lightness or darkness, A denotes red-green value, think of apples, apples are red or green, and B denotes yellow, blue value. The A axis runs from left to right or horizontal. A color measurement movement in the positive A direction means there's a shift towards red. A negative A means a shift towards green. The B axis runs from front to back in a 3D model or top to bottom in a 2D model. A color measurement in the positive blue direction represents a shift towards yellow, and a negative B represents a shift towards blue. The L axis is the third dimension, running perpendicular to their two color axes. A positive L movement denotes a shift lighter. A negative L denotes a shift darker. The L axis itself runs a value of 0 to 100. So when we plot the data measured by a color metric instrument, we get a better understanding of the color space. In this particular example, the following tri-stimulus values were given. L is 55, so on a scale from 1 to 100, that's almost right in the center. The A is 82, so it's a positive A, so we know it's red. B is negative 26, so we know it's blue. It's a blue shade red. So how do we determine the color difference? Assessment of color is more than just a numeric expression. Usually it is an assessment of the color difference between a known standard and a sample. CIE LAB color values are used to compare the colors of two objects. The expression for these color differences are delta, a, delta L, delta A, delta B, or simply DL, DA, DB. The delta or D is the indicator for difference in mathematics. The total difference or distance on the CIE LAB diagram can be stated as a single value known as delta E. And it's the square root of the difference in L value squared, the difference in A value squared, and the difference in B value squared. In 1986, there is an additional formulation or equation that was developed by the Color Measurement Committee of the Society of Dyers and Colorists to help determine a more consistent or easier representation of the color difference. The delta E CMC takes into account a lightness to chroma factor. This factor is traditionally set 2 to 1. Q is a constant defined as 1 and an established commercial factor, or CF, is also taken into account. This creates an ellipsoid around a set standard within a color space. It relates more to visual assessment due to the texture factors being reduced due to the lightness chroma factor based on the application itself. 
And this formula is a little bit more complicated, but of course the modern spectrophotometers and colorimeters um, do this by themselves. So how do we match color? Now that we know how to describe it, how do we put it together? The basic concept is to look and think. So what is the standard? Identify the color you want to match. What material will it be used in? What environment or conditions will be normal for this product? And are there any special requirements that need to be met? Objects modify light. These three objects are all the Pantone Radiant Orchid. Orchid. Um, it's shown in a textile application, a paint application, and a plastic application. All three use the same pigments, but all three visually look different. This is because just as we see color as a reflection of light, the way light passes through or reflects off an object's surface affects what we see. The speed at which refracted light travels is dependent upon the density of the material it is traveling through. This is because the path length of the light has changed. The angle at which the refracted light travels is dependent upon both the angle of incidence, how it hits the, uh, how it hits the surface, and the composition of the material into which it is entering. Color is most successfully matched when the same base of material is used for comparison, apples to apples. If the color standard you are wanting to match is a water-based coating, it is best to use a water-based coating for the sample as well. However, this is not always possible. But if not, the second best option is to use a base material most like that of the final application. So for instance, if the color standard is a paint chip on a color card, but the final application is for a solvent-based ink, then the solvent-based ink should be used as the base for the color match. Conditions always apply. So after determining the material that you're coloring, you should then consider what conditions this color will be subjected to. These include the conditions of the application itself, including your resin type, pH, heat, solvents used, etc., as well as the environment that the final part will be exposed to. Will it be an interior, interior application, exterior, is it a human environment? These conditions, as well as any other specified requirements, will help determine the correct colorant to use. Colorants are normally classified as either pigments or dye stuffs. Pigments are inorganic or organic colored white or black particles which are practically insoluble in the medium in which they are incorporated. They always retain a particulate structure. Dye stuffs, unlike pigments, dissolve during their application and in the process lose their crystal or particulate structure. Pigments originated in the 20th century. According to accepted standards, a pigment is either organic or inorganic. The difference, of course, is in the chemical structure. Pigments are further classified by their chemical composition, actual color, as well as their technical properties. Organic pigments are based on carbon structures, so they always have carbon in their molecule. Inorganic pigments are salt, lattices, or spinels that do not have carbon. Organic pigments in general are about 10 to 20 times stronger than inorganic pigments. They have more chromaticity. They tend to have smaller particle size, are typically more transparent. Performance properties vary greatly with their chemistries and bright full shade colors are achievable. For inorganic pigments, they tend to be more earth tone or nature-like in colors, with some exceptions, of course. They typically are more opaque. They have a broad range of particle size. And performance properties are less variant based on chemistry. So how do we really know the properties? Most pigment manufacturers provide a technical data sheet that outlines the performance properties as well as recommended applications. And even if one is not provided, most payment companies will provide you data that supports whether or not a particular pigment can be used in your application. 
these properties may include weather fastness or light fastness, acid and or alkali resistance, chemical composition, chemical resistance, soluble salts, percent sieve residue, oil absorption, particle size, specific gravity, moisture content, fineness of grind or Hegman gauge, your FDA or purity statements, or any other technical aspects of that particular pigment. Dyes are soluble in the medium in which they are applied. Compared to pigments, they frequently offer higher chroma and color strengths, but opacity is not a strong point. In many cases, durability and fastness properties are well below the level that are offered by pigments. Dyes are most often used in, the, in textile applications. In the plastics industry, dyes are limited in use since they can only be used for a selected number of resins. The main applications and coatings are transparent finishes and effect finishes, wood stains, transparent lacquers, and packaging coatings. So on to Cero's product lines. Cero has a line of complex inorganic color pigments, your CICPs, or mixed metal oxides, ultramarine blues, violets and pinks, iron oxides, chrome oxide green, zinc ferrites, bismuth vanadates, chrome yellow and molly oranges, and we just ac acquired Capel about a week ago, so we now have a full range of organic pigments as well. So we have solutions each color space. For blue, we have your cobalt blues, your cro cobalt chromites, which is closer to um, a blue-green color space, your teals and things of that nature, and of course our ultramarine blues. Our violets, we have the cobalt violet phosphates, strontium violets, as well as ultramarine violets. For the green color space, we have our chrome oxide greens, the green 17, the chrome green spinels, which is our green 26s, um, the cobalt titanate greens are pigment green 50, which is your Kelly green, your bright green. Then we have a full range of yellow, buffs, and browns. We offer some red solutions as well with our iron oxides and molybdate oranges. We have a line of blacks um, all the way from iron oxides through magnesium ferrites. And then we offer cool colors. These are pigments that reflect solar energy, your percent total solar reflectance to help keep things a little cooler. Then we offer custom color matching. Color formulations are created in Farrell's applications laboratories using all available product groups, of course, based on the color and performance properties that are needed. So we have a full crayon box to pull from in order to custom match any color that a customer may need. These custom color blends can be manufactured based on the volume or the color formulation can be provided and individual components sold and utilized. So the industrial practice of color matching, it follows these steps. The first, of course, is the selection of colorants and this is based on your application. Then you prepare an initial match and then adjust the initial match to meet the standard. There are two basic types of matches. The first is your invariant matches. This is where all parameters are the same and all light sources are considered. Then you have your conditional matches. This is a close match under a limited set of illuminating or viewing conditions. It's important to know and agree under which conditions the match is to be judged. So with all that said, what should you remember from this little presentation? In the end, there are three key points to take away. First, color is what is seen. It requires three things, a light source, an object, and an observer. It's similar to the old adage that says, if a tree falls in the woods and nobody's there to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, if the tree reflects light and nobody's there to see it, does it have color? The color sample being judged should be representative of the material to be evaluated for color. The choice of colorants depends on the application and the properties needed. And number three, it's always important to recognize 
process and compensate for the variability that is inherent in every step of the process of preparing and judging samples for color, whether the judgment is made by visual or instrumental techniques. Remember, look, think. The practice of color matching is something that is learned over time with experience. It takes a keen eye along with knowledge and experience of colorants and how they act in various formulations. So thank you for your attention. Um, I think I answered most of the questions that were sent in with the exception of um, two or three of them. The first um, I, I will address is when using um, or when trying to adjust the formulation, color, uh, I'm trying to see, I'm sorry. Is it recommended to try adjusting formulation color using pigments not already used in the formulation? I answer that as um, a negative because then you have to take into account metamerism. When you add uh, another pigment to a pigment blend in order to achieve a color, if it's a different chemistry, it can reflect light differently. So you'll then have an invariant match. So you can look at it under one light source and you'll have a match, but depending on how that additional pigment reflects light, it could affect metamerism under a different light source. And what is the best method for wet matching samples? In my opinion, there are two different ways that we can match wet samples. Um, the first is to apply it in um, a paint or, or a system in which it's going to dry. And the second is to shoot it wet. You can actually use a spectral photometer to, to shoot wet substrates as well. If you have a, um, a guard over the top of your spectro itself, or if you have the, the cardboard cutouts for your particular substrate, you can use those and actually shoot directly wet using a spectral photometer or a colorimeter. So are there any other questions? Don't forget you can type your questions into the question section. Um, I did have a quick one though. What color was the dress? It was blue and black. Was it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it in gold and white in every picture. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think a question just came in. Can you see it? Um, if not, I can read it. Uh, yes, I see. Okay. Is, is there a reference that would help understand the relation between a colorant's chemistry and whether it might improve or worsen corrosion in coatings? Um, not directly as far as chemistry. If it's a colorant itself, it's more about barrier protection. If it's not an inhibitor that's meant to react in a system, if it's just the colorant, then it's the size and um, the packing. So it's more of the structure of the pigment versus the, the chemistry itself. Another question came in from Sarah. Uh, I'm, I'm not really seeing the next one. It says, what is the best way to match a flat into a gloss? What factors do we need to consider when converting between the two? Well, it depends on if you're using the CMC or if you're using, using CIE. If you're using the CIE, um, there are a couple different little tricks to use as far as converting a flat to a gloss. The first, of course, is to add some sheen to your flat. And you can do that by adding a top coat or some uh, linseed or mineral oil on top of the, the coating itself. Or uh, you can match it as a flat uh, by adding filler and then remove the filler uh, in your final application. Those are two of the little tricks that we kind of use here. Um, I'm sure there's other ones, but as far as that's what I'm personally familiar with, those are the two best options to use. 
Another question came in and asked, what is spine? Oh, spinal. Sorry. <laughs> It's a shape. It's um, uh, more of a particulate shape, uh, almost acicular in a way. It has a lattice around it. Um, that's why it, it, it's all de de dealing with, with the structure of the pigment itself. The questions are coming in. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a good resource that can help um, point a person to choosing the right pigment chemistry based on uh, the spectro, what was it called? Uh, spectral photometer. I, I see yeah. that one. Okay. <laughs> okay. So is there a good reference that can help point a person to choosing the right pigment chemistry based on spectral, photo, spectral photomeric data plots, i.e. characteristic peaks? And yes, yes, there is. If uh, most of your spectral photometers, because they measure each individual wavelength, you can see that curve. And each pigment chemistry has its own signature curve. For instance, ultramarine blue has a signature kick at around the 700 nanometer range, where cobalt blues or thalo blues do not. So you can definitely look at the spectral curve and kind of get an indication as to what pigments are in a particular sample. Another question is, is there a way to match colors based on RGB values alone without a physical sample of the color in a product similar to paint? How would I do that? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, and it, it's difficult. You can because you can actually type. There are um, some websites available. If you just type in the RGB values, they'll give you a representative color swatch. Um, I'm not. I'd, Particularly myself, do not like doing it that way because everybody's computer screen is different. It'll give a good starting point, but uh, you can always type in if you have a colorimeter that accepts RGB values. You can type in those values and then shoot things against it so you can get close. It's a lot harder to do it that way, and it takes a lot more steps. It, it's doable, but it's something that you really have to. Um, really get uh, have time to, to really understand what the, what particular system it's going to be used in versus um, what you really have available. I don't know if you would have a spectro that would already have data um, stored. A lot of times we have what's called a database of standards and we can type in representative RGB or LAB values and you can cross-reference it to a to a known standard, that's a little bit easier. Um, but as far as just having the RGB values, I think the best way to approach that is to get a representative swatch. And then based on that color, you, know, you, you perform your initial match based on what you see. And then you physically type in those values into your computer system and shoot your initial match. It looks like there's two more questions. Is there a term like metamorism that refers to pigments that show higher variation at different angles of observation? Rebecca? Rebecca, are you still there? Well, Justin, we'll make sure we get back to you with that answer. All right. Well, that wraps up our presentation. I wanted to thank you very much for attending. Again, a recording of this presentation, along with the uh, presentation itself, will be emailed to you tomorrow morning. If you have any other questions, please reach out to your FitzChem sales rep or send me an email. 
there was one other question. Uh, what is color resistance of organic pigments versus inorganic pigments? We'll go ahead and get back to you directly with an answer. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.